Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees, and on each episode, I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And on this episode, we are going to explore a particularly haunted part of Wrexham, where the ghost stories span the centuries, having begun life as something of an urban legend many years ago, but transformed into something far more terrifying in more recent times. And so, to begin at the beginning... And I should begin by congratulating Wrexham on becoming the latest Welsh city. Wales now has seven cities. Wrexham is no longer a town, which is great news, although it does mean all of my earlier episodes to mention Wrexham and all of my books and articles to mention Wrexham are probably out of date now. But never mind, it's great news that Wrexham is a city. And more than that, Wrexham is a haunted city, as you will discover very soon. And before we dive into the ghost stories on this episode, I should give my thanks to and explain that all of the ghostly accounts on this episode come to us courtesy of Jane Pugh, the wonderful Jane Pugh, who I've mentioned a few times on this podcast now over the years, and who published books about Welsh ghosts in the 1980s and the 1990s. And this particular tale from Wrexham takes place in a part of the city, but back when it was a town, known as the Beast Market. The Beast Market, a market for beasts. And this was a part of the town with a reputation for being haunted because it's where the good people of Wrexham would gather to watch public hangings back in the good old days or bad old days I guess I should say but back when people would gather to watch public executions this is the area where people would be hung in Wrexham and more specifically Jane tells us they would congregate on Charles Street Charles Street which led to this beast market area, which nowadays is known as Eagle Meadows, where superstores were built and where there's a large traffic island, which nowadays stops traffic in its tracks, but back in those bad old days would stop people in their tracks for far grislier reasons because this is where the gallows once stood and this was where the onlookers would stand gawking at the deceased or the soon-to-be deceased as they gasped their last breaths as they swung in the Wrexham air. And unsurprisingly, there are a number of spooky accounts attached to this area. Anywhere with such a gruesome history is naturally going to have ghost stories attached to it. But the earliest supposed gruesome crime to take place here does not involve the gallows. Rather, we are told there was a leather mill in this part of Wrexham with a very rich and a very sadistic owner who, in an account that sounds more like something from an Edgar Allan Poe story, something he would conjure up from his fevered imagination, but in one of the rooms, the sadistic owner is said to have walled up one of his servants and left them to die a horrible death. They were sealed up alive into this wall. And while his reasons for doing so are unknown, if indeed he had any reason for doing so, the proposed theory isn't the usual kind of explanation you'd expect in such ghost stories. Because usually, when a boss is accused of killing a servant, it's usually to silence them for some reason. Maybe they've seen something they shouldn't have seen. Maybe there's an illicit affair to cover up. Maybe there's a pregnancy to hide. But more often than not, there's certainly some premeditated reason, or even if it's in a fit of rage, there is some purpose for this rage. But not in this case, and maybe this makes it even more sinister as a result, because to quote Jane, we are told that this inhuman man might have done so, having read about this horrifying practice, this practice of walling people up alive, being carried out in ages past by religious orders, and thought it a good idea. So the suggestion is that this is a deeply pious man, a religious man, who read about people being walled up like this in days gone by and decided to do the same 
thing himself. And so maybe besides being a sick individual, could there be some twisted justification for carrying out this act? Could it be that in much the same way that innocent people convince themselves that to condemn an innocent woman as a witch, to sentence this woman to death, to hang or to burn, was in some way, in some twisted way, carrying out God's will. Maybe this man was thinking in a similar way, but whatever his reason, he committed this terrible crime, this terrible atrocity in his mill in this part of Wrexham known as the Beast Market many, many years ago. And now we are going to jump forward in time. We're going to jump into our TARDIS, our podcast equivalent of a TARDIS, and flash forward in time to a period I've spoken about many, many, many times on this podcast, my specialist century, you might say. We're going to head to the 19th century, to the Victorian age. And this mill, possibly with that servant still walled up inside it, was converted into a bakery. And reports soon began to emerge of some very strange activity in this bakery. Having converted the mill something strange was happening inside. And the activity reported inside that bakery is another topic I've mentioned many a time on this podcast. They believed it was haunted by a poltergeist. There was poltergeist activity reported at this bakery. Specifically, we are told that ovens would roar into life entirely by themselves. At other times, they would burn so fiercely that the bread inside would burn. So the fire was turned all the way up to 11 and that bread would burn. But it also damaged the bread outside of the oven. So this wasn't just maybe somebody who couldn't use an oven properly because outside of the ovens, the loaves were being damaged and even the ingredients that made the bread wasn't safe. The yeast was found to be ruined, and never mind burning bread, they were unable to make bread full stop with it. Now, with time, these accounts gradually faded away. The ghostly reports just fizzled out. And with many of these 19th century ghost stories, especially those that, that just fizzle out like this, it is natural to point the finger at some human agency, at a a disgruntled servant, maybe, a member of the household. And never mind the paranormal explanations, you can just say, well, this poltergeist activity, it was just a member of staff who was sick of being treated badly and underpaid, or it was just a stroppy teenager who wanted to get their own back at their parents, whatever it might be. And I think in most cases, this is the most believable explanation. I mean, which do you think sounds more likely? A servant being paid a pittance wants a little bit of revenge on their employer, or an evil spirit from beyond the grave who is so bored in the afterlife they want to come back and practice their cooking skills in Victorian Wrexham. You be the judge. But in this case, the story doesn't end there because the activity returned. The poltergeist struck Back. And I don't mean a week later or a few months later or even a few years later. We are going to jump back into our TARDIS in a second because the activity returned long after everyone involved with this case was dead and buried or presumably dead and gone. If not, they were well into their hundreds because the activity returned. And I did say this was a centuries spanning ghost story. It returned in living memory. It was back in the late 1980s. And it was at this time that foolish mortals began some more renovation and rebuilding work in and around this area. Now, when they last did renovation work on this particular building, when it was transformed from a mill into a bakery, the poltergeist kicked off. And frankly, it's just common sense. This beast market area was known to be haunted. And if there's one thing we all know about hauntings, you don't go messing around with them. You certainly don't go knocking down walls 
and foundations and excavating things for the sake of progress after being warned that this is a very haunted area. But that is exactly what they did. All manner of, of smashing and bashing and trashing of these, these presumably much-loved buildings. And as a result, to quote Jane once more, this disturbed the spirits. She tells us, at the time of writing, there has been an increase in accounts of alleged manifestations. An increase in accounts of alleged manifestations. And anyone who has watched a handful of horror films could have warned the decision makers of Wrexham exactly what happens if you go around smashing and bashing much-loved old buildings. And renovating these buildings in this part of Wrexham seems to have had the same effect as Walter Peck shutting down the containment unit in Ghostbusters. Although maybe on a, on a smaller scale, but Whatever spirits, whatever poltergeists were quietly going about their afterlives were suddenly, were rudely awakened. And once more, they were out and about looking for trouble in the big bad world. And joking aside, in one account recorded at this time, a man did indeed die. And some did draw a connection between this man's death and the supposed increase in paranormal activity, which personally I find to be in slightly poor taste, but I will recount the facts to you as I found them. And we are told that a man was found dead in his back garden in this area. And to quote, there was a horrified expression on the face of the corpse. And they began to wonder if he had come face to face with one of the wandering ghosts and died from shock. So had this man died because he'd seen one of these many ghosts that had been unleashed by all this building work? Or was a more likely cause and what I'm assuming was recorded officially, was it simply a heart attack? Now, going back to that mill, going full circle back to the start of this story, that building that was a mill where an evil man bricked up a servant, which was transformed into a bakery that was then taken over by a poltergeist. Well, after smashing things up and moving things around, it became something new. It became something I imagine we've all become accustomed to seeing popping up in all of our cities around the world. It became accommodation, or rather the first and the second floors were made into flats. This old mill, this old bakery was transformed into flats that people could now live in. Rows and rows of flats built on top of a haunted plot of land with a recently unleashed batch of unstable ghosts running around the place, scaring everyone this is where they built some new flats. And to keep the Ghostbusters analogy going, I do like my Ghostbusters analogies on this podcast. But the people who moved into these flats were now in a similar position to Dana Barrett and Lewis Tully, who were just quietly going about their lives, doing their taxes and, and playing piano and cooking eggs and whatever they're doing. Although in a much smaller apartment block, they were not in a Manhattan skyscraper. They were in Wrexham, although North Wales is just like New York in, in the right light. But the people who moved into these flats were totally oblivious to what was coming next. And in one apartment, there are two young female students living together. And both of them had what might be called paranormal experiences. But because they always happened when they were alone, and as such, they had no idea that the other one was experiencing the same things. I am assuming they didn't discuss them because they, they probably doubted their own senses. They didn't want to look silly in front of their friend. You know, guess what? We've moved into, into Spook Central. I think this place is haunted. But when the activity was heard by the two of them together and they started to discuss it, they started to compare notes, as it were, to compare experiences, they realized this has been going on for quite some time and it is not their imagination, and they get a little bit freaked out. 
And this activity includes such good old poltergeist activity as heavy footsteps stomping about the place, knocking on doors, which, of course, if you're alone, is a bit creepy and is even creepier if you open the door quickly and there's no one there. And there were some heavy thuds thrown in for good measure. And in one example, since all of this had come to light, one of the girls was in bed when she heard these very sounds. She heard knocking on the door. She heard those footsteps, those ghostly footsteps outside. And she called out to what she assumed was her flatmate to come in. But there was no reply. When she got up and went to the door, she found, surprise, surprise, there was nobody behind it. The landing was empty. And when she walked downstairs, she found her flatmate typing away in the living room, where she claimed to have been for at least half an hour. So that's one example of the kind of activity the girls were encountering, but by far the creepiest discovery of all, and this really does bring our story full circle, is that when the two girls, along with their landlord, were decorating the flat, giving it a lick of paint, hanging up some new wallpaper, and of course, of course, that ghost wasn't going to let them do that peacefully. If there's one thing we've learned on this episode, ghosts do not like redecorating. But in the bedroom, in the same bedroom we've just discussed where there were knocks on the doors and stamps outside, they were ripping off the old wallpaper. And they discovered that a part of the wall underneath had been blocked off many years ago. And I hope at this point in the tale, the hairs on the back of your neck have just started standing up. So underneath the wallpaper hidden in that bedroom was a section of the wall that had been blocked off many years ago. Now, the girls had no idea why. Neither did the landlord, I'm assuming. But the mystery deepened when... As they were working out the dimensions for re-papering, when they were, I'm assuming, going around with a measuring tape, checking corner to corner, how much do we need? They discovered an area over the corridor and staircase, which was, to quote, puzzling as it did not seem necessary. So they found a blocked off wall. Then they found this unnecessary piece of some room jutting out over the staircase they could think of no possible purpose for. Was this just wasted space? Well, these girls who, after experiencing all of these strange sounds in their flat, might, just might, have found evidence that that story from many, many years ago, what sounds like an urban legend of some evil mill owner walling up a servant alive, had they found evidence that backed up this story, they had certainly found a blocked off wall. They had certainly found a section of the building that no one could get to and seemed to serve no purpose. Did this add a bit of credibility to the suggestion that evil mill owner did indeed brick up a servant and if so were they responsible for the hauntings for the poltergeist activity that plagued this building for the centuries that followed there in Wrexham just off Charles Street in an area once known as the Beast Market. Well, the answer to that question remains a mystery for now. But to wrap up this episode on a lighter note, I don't like ending on a downer. And we are told that those two girls, those two girls in that flat, were not afraid of their ghostly housemate. Even if they weren't paying their share of the rent, they weren't split in the cost three ways, I am assuming. But they were said to be hopeful that when the renovations were finished, when all the painting and the decorating was done they might calm down once more. So like all the other ghosts in the area, this ghost didn't like having their afterlife disturbed by meddling young girls moving things about. But hopefully, after the place had been given a lick of paint, they could rest in peace once more. And they even gave the ghost a name, which 
might have sounded quite nice in the 1980s. It's a little bit more unfortunate nowadays, but they called him Dick. Dick the Ghost, which I am hoping is Dick as in short for Richard, a good, honest Welsh name like Richard Burton. Dick and Liz, Liz and Dick, as opposed to Dick as a comment on, as a reflection of the ghost's behaviour. But I guess the only way we'll really know the truth behind all of this is to do even more renovation work, which, frankly, as we all know, is a little bit dangerous in Wrexham. If you start messing with these buildings, who knows what you might unleash? Who knows what terrors we might set free in Wrexham? Maybe Dick is lying in wait to come out once more. And frankly, Wrexham, while it might be very similar to Manhattan, does not have the Ghostbusters to come and save the day. Although I guess it does have its own heroes. Nowadays, maybe we could bring on the Deadpool and Rob McElhenney. And on that note... We've reached the end of another episode of the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. And if you've enjoyed this episode and you haven't already, please consider hitting the subscribe button and you will never miss an episode ever. And if you want more Wrexham ghost stories, my favourite ghost story of all is from Rosset, just on the outskirts of Wrexham. But if you want more Wrexham ghost stories, I've recorded a few over the years, back in the days when Wrexham was a town rather than a city. And you can find all of those in the archive. And if you've really enjoyed this episode, you can help support the podcast and keep me going well into the future by treating me to a coffee via my website. Or you could just leave a nice review, a nice rating. And if you'd like more ghosts and folklore from Wales, you can follow me on social media. I'm on all of the main platforms. And as well as this podcast, I've also written a number of books about similar weird and wonderful subjects, which are available from all good bookshops offline and on. And on that note, it just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian Amrando. I've been Mark Rees. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast, beaming to you from Wales to the world. And remember, if you're thinking of doing some DIY, it's always worth checking behind the walls. Until next time, no star. <laughs>